In this tutorial, we will be looking at the most common passive elements which are encountered in both AC and RF circuits. These are resistors, capacitors and inductors. In particular, we will be concentrating on the voltage and current waveforms for these elements and we will demonstrate how we can use the ratio of their amplitudes and also their relative phases to work out what impedance or admittance is seen by our generator. The first thing we do is go to Project Options and select the frequency of operation which we desire. In this case we'll be, we will be working at 1 GHz. So we type 1 in the start box, select single point and then apply. Next we go to the Global Units tab and we will select units for inductance and capacitance which will work well for us at 1 GHz. For the inductance we can keep nano Harris, but for the capacitance we need to choose a smaller unit. In this case we'll go for picofarads and click OK. Next we go to circuit schematics, right click, open a new schematic, we will call it voltage and current for passive, maximize the schematic and then the first thing that we need to get is a voltage source for a circuit so we'll just press Control L and then type in the box ACVS AC voltage source place it on the schematic move the list of parameters to one side and then add a ground connection now the first circuit we will be looking at will be a simple potential divider so we need to get a couple of resistors in here press Control L again type RES and select the resistor in closed form place it on the schematic and then if you need another one all you need to do is just press Control C and Control V and then you have a copy of the element that you had selected we right click to rotate it place it on the schematic and add a ground reference now we can connect everything together. Next we select the value of resistors that we are interested in. Because a radio frequency often enough we encounter 50 ohm as a resistance or impedance, we will choose just that. Also for a signal generator we will choose an amplitude of 2 volts. This makes the maths uh, easier and more intuitive because you have a simple a resistive potential divider with equal resistors and hence you will have one volt dropped across one resistor and one volt dro dropped across the other load resistor. Now we want to be able to see the uh, voltage and current waveforms for this circuit in particular for the load resistor R2. So how can we do that? There are a number of ways in microwave office to do this but I would go for the most obvious ones for now and in the future we'll be seeing what other options are available. First of all, let's press Ctrl L again and type in the box V underscore meter and place it on the schematic like so. This is effectively a, a voltmeter and hence we can just connect it across the terminals of our load resistor and we'll be able to then observe the time domain waveform of the voltage across this element. So let's just use the wiring tool to wire it in. Now what we would like to do also is measure the current that flows through our load resistor and to do this we can use an element in microwave office which is called I meter. First of all though let's make a little bit of space for it. So I will just drag the cursor on the elements that I want to move and then grab them and shift them to one side. Then I'll remove the connection between the resistor and the source because I want to place my ammeter just there. So let's press Ctrl L and type I underscore meter and place it in series with the source like so. And then as usual we'll use the wiring tool to just connect it. Okay, so now we have a means of measuring the current that flows through the circuit and hence through the resistor, through the load resistor R2 
and also we have a way to measure the voltage across our load resistor R2. So we're in a position now to um, go onto graphs, right click, select a new graph, a rectangular graph, we'll call it again voltage and current, and then we can add measurements which will be displayed on this graph. Let's right click on it to do this and select add a new measurement. Now in this case we have to go on to the uh, non-linear section and you can see that here we've got both voltage and current. Let's start with the voltage and then select V time from the list of possible measurements. The data source name is the correct one, of course we've only got one schematic. And the measurement component, they will just uh, select the pull down menu, you can see it can be one of two things. Either the uh, voltage source, so this one would give us the voltage that's coming out of our uh, voltage source, or the meter that we've placed on the schematic, and of course this is the one that we want. Click apply, and then go on to current, and select I time, which as before is the time domain uh, waveform for the current in our circuit. In terms of the measurement component, in this case, again we have two choices, either our signal source or the um, I meter component that we placed on the schematic ourselves. In this case, it doesn't matter so much what we choose, because for the simple circuit that we set up, the current will be the same across all elements, but just to be consistent with our choice, let's select I meter for now and click on apply and then OK. So we set up our graph and our measurements so all we need to do now is just click on simulate. As you can see because voltage and current have got very different units the current has got units of milliamps and the voltage has got units of volts we end up with uh, a graph where one uh, waveform looks very small and the other one looks much bigger. And this is a common problem which is encountered and uh, we would like ideally to be able to see both waveforms uh, of a reasonable size. This problem can be rectified very easily in microwave office and we'll just see how to do it right away. We right click on the graph and select properties. Then we go on to the measurements tab and you can see that here uh, you've got a list of measurements and the axis that they're associated with. So you can have two axes on a two-dimensional graph, a two vertical axis that is, one on the left hand side and one on the right hand side. At the moment the voltage is associated with the left axis and if we click on the current we can see that the current is also associated with the left axis. So we just select right for the current and click on apply and this way you can see that a new scale has appeared on the uh, right hand side of the graph to signify that now that is the uh, axis to which the current waveform refers to. Let's click on OK. Now there is another problem as you can see. A microwave office auto scales the graph. Uh, and that's a very good thing, particularly when you're tuning elements uh, that can be very advantageous. However, in a situation like this, you may want to be able to set the scale yourself in such a way as to make sure that you can see two waveforms which are in phase, like in this case, um, uh, as distinct. This can be done really quite easily. Let's go back to properties yet again and go on to axis you can see that for the left axis we've got auto limits selected and what we can do is just untick this option and choose a minimum and a maximum value for our left axis, left vertical axis let's say minus 1.5 and 1.5 so that we will be able to see the two waveforms as distinct let's click on apply and then OK Le voila so now we can see the voltage and current as distinct waveforms and it is very apparent that the two waveforms are perfectly in phase with one another which is what we would expect. Now, we know the phase difference between them is zero so our impedance will be entirely resistive which will come as no surprise to you. 
But what about the ratio of their amplitudes? Well, uh, there is an easy way and a very useful way to, uh, to measure this in microwave office. We can use markers. Although in this case it is extremely obvious from the graph what the values are, just for the uh, concept of the exercise, let's just go through this process of inserting markers on a graph. This will become a lot more useful as we carry on. So to insert a marker, you can do it in two ways. You can either right-click and go on to Add Marker, or you can simply press, and I prefer this, Control m and then click on the waveform where you want to insert the marker. So I'm clicking on the current waveform, and there you go, the marker appears. If I press Control m again, and then I click on the voltage waveforms, another marker appears. You can uh, uh, click on the marker and drag it along to any point on the waveform. But another useful thing that you can do is just right-click on the marker readout and then select where you want the marker to go. In this case, we want to see the peak amplitude of our waveforms, so we just select marker to max for the current waveform and the same for the marker which we placed on the voltage waveform. So let's just click on marker to max. Now you can see that the voltage is around 1 volt and the current amplitude is 20 milliamps. And it is very easy to see that 1 volt over 20 milliamps will give you a ratio of 50, which is uh, the 50 ohm resistance that um, we've got on the schematic. Now let's go back to our circuit schematic and replace our resistive load with a simple capacitor. So we just click on the resistor and press delete and then press Control L and type cap in the search box. This gets us a simple capacitor. We right click to turn it and place it on the schematic like so. Now we'll choose a value for our capacitor which is identical to the one that we've used in the manual. So let's choose 5.6 picofarads. OK. And now click on simulate and go back to the graph. Now you can see very clearly that there is a phase difference between the voltage and current waveforms in, in this case. And this is what we would expect. Now, first of all, let's um, right click on the markers here and uh, put them back onto the peak values of the current and voltage waveforms. Right click on this marker, select marker to max. Same thing for the voltage marker. So we can see now that we've got a voltage which is again approximately 1 volt, but the current now has gone up from 20 milliamps to almost 35 milliamps. Now we can use these two values to work out the ratio of the amplitudes of voltage and current, and this will give us the modulus of our complex impedance. The other thing that we can do is work out the relative phases of voltage and current. To do so, we could just look at the difference between the timestamps which are associated with the voltage peak and the current peak. This would give us the uh, phase in terms of time difference, and then we can just use a simple formula to convert this into an angle. However, uh, in as much as in this case we have very simple sinusoidal waveforms and hence it is easy to, uh, to, to use the peaks to work out the phase difference, there are instances when uh, this would not be quite so easy because the waveform may be modulated, for instance, or it may be distorted and hence the, the peaks will not be as well defined as we can see in, in, in the figure here. So it is much easier and uh, it's a much more reliable measurement to use the zero crossings of the waveforms to work out the relative phases of two sinusoid. To do this, we could use uh, markers. We could move the markers that we've already got to the zero crossing point. But for now, I'll leave the markers for the amplitude where they are and add two additional markers. There's no extra cost for them after all. So I'll press Control m and click on the current waveform and then I press Control m again and click on the voltage waveform. Now what I can do is right click on the readout of each marker and select marker search. 
and then select 0 as the value that I'm searching for so that I can find the uh, 0 crossing on the, lo along the y-axis. So I'll click on search and uh, you can see that we found the 0 crossing for the current. For the voltage we can do the same, just click on the marker readout and then click on search. And again we found the 0 crossing. Now we've got the timestamps for the zero crossing of the voltage and the zero crossing of the current. We can work out the delta T, the time difference, and then from this we can work out the uh, phase difference between the two waveforms. Now, as you can see from the graph, the current leads the voltage. And this is obvious because the current reaches a peak before the voltage does. And this is how you usually work these this things out. Uh, whichever waveform, for the same point, whichever waveform reaches it first is the one that actually leads. So uh, we've worked out the modulus of our impedance as the uh, ratio of the voltage and current amplitude. Now the phase of our impedance is the difference between the phase of the voltage waveforms and the phase of the current waveform. And because the current leads the voltage, i.e. the voltage lags the current, the difference between the phase of the voltage and the phase of the current, theta v minus theta i, is negative. And it's equal to 90 degrees. So our impedance will be something like this, as we explained in the manual. Now, let's delete some of these markers and go back to our schematic. What I'm going to do now is to make the value of the capacitor tunable and uh, we'll see what effect this has on, on our results. So I'll just click on the screwdriver which is the tune tool and then click on the parameter that I want to tune in this case the capacitance of the capacitor C1 and press escape. Now we go back to our graph and we open the tune tool and we'll see what happens to our waveforms as we increase or decrease the value of the capacitor. So as I increase the value of the capacitor you can see that the current is actually increasing whereas the voltage amplitude is decreasing. Well it makes a great deal of sense to me because what we're doing is increasing the ability of the capacitor to store charges we are choosing a bigger capacitance, so the capacitor is actually able to store more charge and hence it will try to draw more current from the generator to fill up. Now, if the capacitor draws more current from the generator, this means that the overall current that goes through the circuit will be higher and hence the current through the resistor R1 will also be higher. This means, in turn, that the voltage drop across R1 will be higher. So if the voltage drop across R1 is higher, inevitably the voltage drop across C1 will be lower because we always have to adhere to KVL, the Kirchhoff voltage law. And hence, we, if one voltage decreases, the other will have to increase and vice versa. And this is just what we're seeing here. Increasing the, decreasing the capacitance means that we decrease the current and hence the voltage drop across the resistor will decrease and that across the capacitor will increase. And as we increase the capacitance, so the voltage drop across the resistor increases and the voltage drop across the capacitor decreases. OK, let's close the tune tool now and go back to our schematic once again. Now we are going to remove our capacitor and we will swap it for an inductor so that we can have an inductive load. Press Ctrl L and type IND. Rotate and place on the schematic like so. Now we'll select a value for our inductor which is the same as the one that we've used in the manual 4.5 nanoharries. And then we click on simulate and we'll take a look at the graph and we can see now that uh, uh, the markers are all over the place now but we can see clearly that the voltage in this case leads the current so we're in a completely dual situation to what we had with the capacitor 
and this is to be expected. Now what uh, we can do is just right click on the marker here and say marker to max and then right click on this marker here and also say marker to max and this way we can see the voltage and current um, for this element. You can see that once again uh, the current is higher than the one that we had for the resistor and um, it is uh, kind of lower than the one we had for the capacitor but the voltage is kind of the same. Now yet again we can use these values of uh, the voltage amplitude and the current amplitude to work out the uh, modulus of our impedance and um, also we can take a look at the uh, zero crossings for this waveform and um, we can use the um, timestamps relative to the zero crossings of voltage and current waveforms to, um, to work out the relative phase of uh, voltage and current. So let's do just that. Let's press Ctrl M, click on the voltage waveform and then again Ctrl M and click on the current waveform. As before we could have used the uh, peak values, well the timestamps relative to the peak values but I think it's good to um, establish uh, good practice which can be applied in any case and hence use the zero crossings to work out the phase difference between waveforms. So again we right click on the marker readout, go to marker search, zero is already there, click on search and we'll do the same uh, for the other marker. Now yet again we can uh, work out the uh, phase difference between these two waveforms. It will come as no surprise to you that yet again uh, the phase difference in absolute value is 90 degrees. However remember that the impedance uh, um, has got a modulus which is equal to the ratio of the amplitudes of voltage and current waveforms and has got a phase which is equal to the phase of the voltage minus the phase of the current. In this case the voltage leads the current and hence the difference between theta V and theta I is positive and equal to 90 degrees. This means that we can uh, write uh, our impedance in a polar form or Cartesian form as shown. Okay, now let's remove the markers that we've inserted to work out the timestamps of the zero crossings and uh, go back to our schematic and as we did for our capacitor let's make the value of the inductor tunable. So we'll click on the tune tool and then on the value of L for L1. Press escape and then we'll go back to our graph and we open the tune tool so that we can change the value of the inductor and see what happens to the voltage and current waveforms. Now let's increase the value of the inductor you can see that as I increase the value of the inductor the amplitude of the voltage is increasing as the current is decreasing. So why is that? Let's try to explain this in a physical way. Increasing the value of the inductance means that the uh, element is able to establish a magnetic field and maintain it in a much more efficient and effective way. So to establish the same magnetic field it needs uh, less current to flow through it. This is done for instance by inserting more turns on the inductor which means that then you have the current going through a higher number of loops so for the same current you can establish a higher magnetic field. Another way to increase the inductance is uh, inserting some sort of uh, material uh, inside the coils which helps the uh, magnetic field being uh, trapped um, uh, within uh, the, the space of the inductor and hence makes it more efficient to establish the field and maintain it. So effectively increasing the inductance means that we uh, don't need to have as much current to establish the same uh, field and hence to have the same um, EMF, the same voltage across the uh, inductor and hence the inductor will demand less current from our generator. If the inductor is demanding uh, less current from our generator that means that the current that flows through the resistor also which is the same as that that flows through the inductor is lower and hence because the current through the resistor is lower the voltage dropped across it uh, will be lower also. 
Now, because of KVL, if the voltage across one element diminishes, then the voltage across the other element must increase. So um, the voltage across the inductor uh, will have to increase. So effectively what we're saying here is that uh, having a higher inductance, which may be determined by having more turns on the inductor or some type of material inside it that helps the field being established and maintained, means that we will need less current to establish the same field and the same voltage across the element. And, and hence, there will be less current drawn from the signal generator. Because there is less current drawn from the signal generator, the overall current through the circuit is lower also, because it's the same across every element. The voltage drop across the resistor will be lower, and hence that across the inductor will be higher. We can also see that as we decrease the value of inductance, we have the exact opposite um, trend. So we are now demanding more current to establish our magnetic field and our voltage uh, across uh, the inductor, um, and um, we are getting a lower voltage across the terminals of the inductor because more current is flowing through the resistor, and hence a higher voltage is dropped across its terminals.